Good evening, everybody. I'm uh, I'm using a microphone. I'm not used to using a microphone in this particular room. It's good to see everybody here tonight. Um, we really have had a lot of meetings in this room over the last, uh, let's say, 15 years, maybe longer, uh, regarding uh, nuclear issues here in Vermont. In particular, we spent a lot of time in this room fairly recently uh, on the ongoing campaign, successful campaign, uh, to close Vermont Yankee. And, you know, the people celebrated, and many people were happy. And I'm happy to report that every time I go to a nuclear decommissioning citizens advisory panel meeting in Brattleboro, Energy Corporation reports at the beginning of every one of their reports, they report that in fact, Vermont Yankee is cold and dark. Okay. Of course, there are now 58 dry casks filled with irradiated fuel rods sitting on a parking lot that have nowhere to go. No science, uh, sound scientific destination. And that's what we're, we're dealing with now. And we're under no illusions that Vermont Yankee is not the, uh, the front page, you know, top of the fold issue that it was all those years that we fought so hard. But the fact remains that the waste at Vermont Yankee and at 100 and sub odd sites all across the country is a significant problem that has to be dealt with. And we've taken it upon ourselves to see to it that sound science and justice are applied to the solution. And this is not going to be an easy fight. Nonetheless, we're taking it on. I'm here tonight uh, with my, uh, my colleagues uh, from the Vermont Yankee Decommissioning Alliance, who to this day, we meet monthly here in Montpelier and everybody's welcome. I'm also here with my uh, colleagues from the Citizens Awareness Network, Deb Katz. I'm also here with uh, the Executive Director of the Nuclear Information and Resource Service in Washington, D.C., Tim Judson. And President of CAN. And I'm the board chair of the Nuclear Information and Resource Service. It just goes round. <laughs> and we have two very, very special guests with us tonight uh, who are going to be with us on this tour uh, uh, around uh, uh, Vermont and Massachusetts. This is the beginning of a long, long organizing process. Kirsten Rudick is from Germany. And Kirsten will talk to us about her experiences and her organization's experiences with fights around high-level nuclear waste in Gorleben, Germany. This is powerful stuff that has gone on over generations. And of course, lately, you know, there's always a new proposal. Lately, they're talking about setting up a giant interim parking lot dump in the state of New Mexico, not very far, of course, from a couple of very well-known weapons laboratories. But I left my tinfoil hat out in, the, out in the truck, and I'm not going to go on much about it. No, it's significant. Leona Morgan is with us. And Leona is with the Nuclear Issue Study Group. And she's also part of the Navajo Nation, or Diné, which I'm learning to get right. And I have to say, Leona, and excuse my, uh, my French, is an ass-kicking organizer. I'm so happy that she's here. So we also have one other member with us, and the member is out there on a trailer, the mock nuclear waste cask. That cask. Uh, was originally built uh, some 20 years ago and had five siblings around the country, each one stationed in a different region. And the casks did this. 
did public education around high-level nuclear waste, and at that time, Yucca Mountain, which is back. We rehab that cask, and we're going to be taking it tomorrow night to Brattleboro, uh, Thursday night to Greenfield, where those of you who remember uh, our lobbyist, Bob Stannard, will be performing with um, Wildcat O'Halloran doing the blues in Greenfield, so we'll be having some fun. We're then going to move on to the State House in Boston, where we're working with the Cape Down Winders, among others, about the imminent closure of the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Plant. And from there, uh, we will have uh, another uh, program in Plymouth, uh, much closer to the reactor. So this is the start. Uh, there are activities in other regions, um, but the public has to know about high-level nuclear waste because it's just not acceptable for people to say, hey, it's got to go somewhere, and as long as it isn't near where I live, I don't care. With that, I'm going to introduce uh, Leona Morgan. And as I said, she's a wonderful organizer. She has an insight about her home that Vermonters have to hear. So please welcome Leona Morgan. Thank you, Chris. OK, so um, I need someone to forward the slides for me, please. OK. Uh, good evening. Thank you for everyone for coming. Um, so I'm here on this uh, can cast tour, and this is my first time here in Mont Montpelier. Is that how you say it? I was saying Montpelier. Okay, so uh, I live in Albuquerque, and I am Dinek. Our people are indigenous to the southwest um, in an area we call the Four Corners. So this is a picture here of what is Monument Valley. Um, this is a really iconic landscape of the Southwest. I don't know how many of you guys have seen uh, John Wayne movies. I've never seen any, but apparently this is where they did a lot of filming and a lot of their folks, the film crew and others died from different types of cancers. This is a contaminated place like most of the areas um, on our people's land. So um, I'd just like to start the presentation off with this picture because it's really pretty. But um, the truth is it's, it's uh, contaminated. Um, but go ahead, go to the next slide. So I have uh, eight, 10 minutes to go through all of these topics. And so I'm gonna do so now. <laughs> go ahead, next slide. So um, first and foremost, I work on issues of uh, what we call nuclear colonialism. So in order for nuclearism to exist, the, this was all written about by a lot of academics and um, people like Winona LaDuke, you know, they've talked about nuclear colonialism since the 80s. Um, I like to use this term because people think colonization is something of the past, but it, it is very much still happening today. Um, probably not the way it did in the past, but now more so with the mining of minerals, um, the taking of water rights, and then like uh, how I like to explain it is they're, you know, they've stolen our land and our water, um, tried to kill our people off, but now they're killing our future. So the genetic impacts, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the cultural impacts. Um, so this is uh, one of some of the... Uh, the, the, the things that need to exist in order for nuclearism to, to move forward is that the government and the entities that create nuclear weapons, they, they, have, they do a lot of this in secret. And there's this um, mass numbing and othering which have to do with basically uh, making these things seem like they're occurring to, to people who are um, have less rights, or that you know, are um, this, this idea that it's it's okay to basically 
do these things because um, like indigenous folks or people in rural areas may not, may, I guess we're expendable is, is, is what I'm trying to get at. Um, so go ahead, next slide. So um, this here is, is the nuclear fuel chain minus the weapons. So I'm gonna talk a lot about the, the front end. So we call it uranium mining. And I'm sorry, the print is so small, but it basically starts with uranium mining. And there's a couple of different types of uranium um, mining, either in situ leach mining or what we call conventional mining, when you get the ore out of the ground and then you have to process it at a mill where you make yellow cake. And then there's all these different types of uh, processing and conversion in order to make um, the uranium fuel that is used in your power plants. And I say your power plants because we don't have any power plants in New Mexico, not, not a commercial scale power plant anyways. Um, there's one in Arizona and that's the closest to us. So what we're dealing with and what we want to talk about is right here. And so like I said, this is the nuclear fuel chain, not the nuclear fuel cycle. Um, but we are missing the weapons which are very present in New Mexico. So um, next slide. So um, I'm from New Mexico, but uh, my people were there before New Mexico existed. And I'm going to get a little bit into that, but before I do, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the different health impacts from uranium mining, because um, we're dealing with a lot of contamination from the past mining, um, which, which is basically still there. There's uh, 15,000 abandoned mines across the United States, um, and, and there's very little health studies. So just like, um, I don't know how many of you guys have heard about the secret agreement between the International Atomic Energy Agency and the World Health Organization to not publish um, health data on the impacts from nuclear facilities. There, th this, this is specific to uranium mining that there are some health studies that have been done by individuals through private funding and just um, Basically, people that know what's going on and know that the government is never going to pay for this kind of stuff. So a lot of it has been done under an organization um, called the Southwest Research and Information Center, which did this DNEP project. Um, so the studies are being done out of UNM. And, and, and basically what they found is that over long periods of time, people living close to low level radioactive um, radi radiation exposure are subject to these different health problems. So this is a lot of this is self-reported, um, but they're also doing actual studies to, to show the direct impacts. And what they're finding is a lot of um, kidney disease and autoimmune disorders. So there's two types of ways um, we're uh, impacted, and it's either from the radioactivity or the um, chemical toxicity. So uranium as a heavy metal, and then you know all of the exposure we get from radiation. The next slide. So this is just a, to give you guys an idea of what it looks like out there and how um, uranium moves around. So like when uranium's in the ground naturally occurring, it doesn't it doesn't really go anywhere on its own. Um, but once it's oxygenated through different processes, um, mostly um, anthropogenic, uh, then it, it, it's able to move throughout the environment. So right here is a mine, and you can see it's, it's a little bit higher up than these houses here. So basically when it rains, the mine waste will wash down, and then like right here, it goes into this uh, little waterway, which will go down here and then join, you know, other other um, bodies of water. And we don't have a lot of water in the desert, so it's, it's, it's really bad when water gets contaminated. Here, this is, um, you know that picture at the beginning that I showed you? That was facing the east, but if you turned around the direct opposite direction, this is a mesa that would have been behind you, and this is one of the places where there was a mine up here. And so this one, this mine here, they, um, the government is doing uh, some cleanup a cleanup of, of uranium mining. It's not done very well. So basically what they did is brick in, oh my battery's dying. They bricked in the mine here to, to try to contain the uranium so it doesn't get out. But you can see from this, uh, these white, this white line that the uranium is still coming out and the other chemicals and whatever they used up there to mine and then it's washing down behind these people's houses. Um, next slide. So everywhere 
that there is mining, it's transported very easily. And so these are just other pictures of native communities. This is a mill, a mill, uh, a mill tailings pile of waste that's flowing toward the school. This is the world's largest open pit uranium mine near Pawati. This is a picture, um, I'm, this is a fight we're dealing with. Uh, this is a transport of uranium um, in a truck. And this is, an, a, we, we use this picture in a fight we call Hall No, so I got my t-shirt here. So these are different ways uranium mine waste and mill tailings are transported. Next slide. And so basically, next slide. We're dealing with over, um, like I said, 15,000 mines that have not been cleaned up. And on the Navajo Nation, we have about a little bit over 500, and that is an area that is getting some cleanup. So next slide. And so this just shows all of the areas with mines, and then the blue squares show mills. There's only one mill currently operating in the country, and that's in um, Utah. So this is, this is what we call the four corners. So New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Colorado. Next slide. And um, this is a picture of, again, how uranium, how close it gets to houses. So there's some houses right here. You can't really see them, but they're little dots in between um, some mines. And then this was a mill. So this, all, this was all operating mostly in the 70s and the 80s. But what happened here is the world's largest uranium tailing spill. So um, next slide. I'm coming from an area that's dealing with a lot of contamination. I didn't grow up in this area, but she, she lives in this area and they have kids, you know, they play there, they live there all the time, and they're currently impacted by past mining. Um, next slide. That, that's still very um, present. Go ahead, next slide. So I just wanted to show you all those pictures because we're, we're still dealing with the mess from uranium mining and now there's threats of new mining on one of our sacred mountains. Go ahead, next slide. And so right now, specifically, we're dealing with two sites. Um, of, these are conventional mine sites. Go ahead, next slide. And so, um, next slide. This is a, so specifically, um, we, I'm gonna go through a couple of new threats of, of nuclear stuff, and then I'm just gonna wrap up here. Um, this is the Navajo Nation. This is our, our tribal uh, government area where we have uh, what's called a jurisdiction under, uh, it's the technical term for the jurisdiction is Navajo Indian country. Um, however, I just wanted to be clear that, like Chris was stating, I'm Diné, so I'm not Navajo, the government is Navajo, and the United States calls us Indian, but we're, we're not, we're indigenous. So anyways, this is a site of a uranium mine at the Grand Canyon that wants to transport the uranium along this route to the only mill. And the reason I bring in this picture up is because all of the stuff I just showed you, the Navajo Nation, because of all that stuff, the Navajo Nation has passed a law saying no more uranium mining and a law that says no transport of radioactive materials unless it's for cleanup or for medical use. So even though this road goes right through Navajo Nation, we're saying, um, you know, you, you can't haul through our res, you know, haul no, you can't take this uranium ore through our communities again. But our tribe has stated to us, um, they can't do anything about it because these are US highways and federal highways. So next slide. So um, that's gonna, I'm gonna connect that to the issue of what we're talking about tonight, which is nuclear waste. This is a map of New Mexico, and all these tiny dots are different types of uh, extractive industries and different, place, different types of contaminating activities such as oil and gas mining, fracking, and that kind of thing. Here in the southeast, the legislators of New Mexico want to build what's called an energy sector, and it's, and it's overlapping the, one of the largest oil producing areas in the country. Um, there's a lot of underground caves and the geology there. It's just really not suited for what they're doing. Here, here in this part of the in this part of the state is where they want to build uh, this centralized interim storage uh, being proposed by Coltec. Uh, so next slide. And so this is a map of all the reactors in the country, um, and the proposal for Coltec is to bring over 173,000 tons of, of waste. But then there's another site just about 40 miles away called Waste Control Specialist that wants to bring 40,000 tons of high level radioactive waste. Go ahead, next slide. And so here's a map um, of the Navajo Nation again. And um, these, are, these are all the railroads um, in, 
in uh, the south, in our two states of Arizona and New Mexico. And so the site is right here, which is Holtec, and there's WCS. Holtec is only 12 miles north of WIP, which is the Waste Isolation Pilot Project, where they store waste from weapons already. So in New Mexico, we have like nuclear facilities around in Los Alamos and Sandia Labs, and we have all this uranium mining. We have tons of things. But what we're dealing with now is this proposal, and specifically for Navajo Nation, I'm working to get to get some um, awareness about the transport possibly through this right here. This is where the railroad goes through. But because of the lack of jurisdiction on the rails, again, my tribe, we're not able to stop it with our law. So I'm coming out here to talk with you guys all. Um, next slide. And to basically just, you know, explain that us, our folks in New Mexico, so as a New Mexico resident and as a Navajo Nation um, member of the, the tribe, we, we don't want it. And so we're, we had a lot of opposition to these mines, I mean, I'm sorry, to this proposal for the waste because of our experience with the mines. And so we're, what we're wanting is to, our organization, Nuclear Issue Study Group, we want to have some real dialogue between people living near reactors and, 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 and us to see, well, what can we do about it? Because we do know some places the waste has to move, like in San Onofre, California, because it's so close to the ocean. So we know there's no one size fits all solution, but um, yeah, so I'm just, I'm just here to give you guys a glimpse of what we're dealing with out ho at home. But um, now we've got all this new stuff and people don't really understand what it's about because we don't have nuclear reactors. So anyways, I wanted to say thank you. And um, yeah. So, um, thank you, Leona. Uh, when we're through with uh, uh, the speakers, we are gonna be having uh, a pretty long uh, question and answer session. So keep those questions uh, ready. Our next speaker is uh, Kirsten Rudick. And Kirsten is going to more fluently give you the name of her organization. I'm merely going to give you an English translation. The Citizens Environmental Initiative in Gorleben, Germany, or in the environs of Gorleben, Germany. I gotta tell you, I've been a anti-nuclear organizer for a long time. And part of what we have to do to get ourselves up going in the morning is get motivated. And one of the things that has motivated me for decades is the activity around opposing the transport of high-level nuclear waste to Gorleben, Germany. So please welcome Kirsten Rudek to share some of their insight there in Gorleben. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me, for inviting us. The name of my initiative is Bürgerinitiative Umweltschutz durch Udandenberg. And it's uh, more than 40 years old. So I have a PowerPoint, but I won't show it. I have these cards with me, with my email address. And I, I have enough for everyone to give one. So who wants my PowerPoint? Take a card and you can have a look at it. There are also some pictures in it and many information in English language. We did it. And um, in the end, we're going to take some minutes to have some photos. I have a slideshow that I can show you. And I want to talk, want to give you a brief overview about what is the Gualim place about, and especially talk about the transports and the final deposit search we have in Germany since some years going on. So. Uh, I want to say I'm also organized uh, not only with Bürgerinitiative Umweltschutz, but also in a campaign called Don't Need the Climate. And uh, we are working on the World Climate Summits to prevent the World Summits, Summit Climates from, uh, from nuclear power, because there are many forces going for it. So our nuclear site volume was declared 1977 to be a nuclear center. And this is a funny story. I mean, it's a sad story or an angry, angry story, but our prime minister pointed out with this finger on a map yeah. in the eight o'clock evening news that Wadim is going to be nuclear center. So this is famous. Everybody knows this photo 
in Germany. And from one moment to another, we had really big protests. Because two years before, in 1975, there had been some plans to build up a nuclear power plant only five kilometers away from Gordon. But these plans were canceled. So people like were getting big ears when they heard about oh nuclear center at Gordon. There was already some small kind of organization. People had tried to talk about things, and like in between one week or two, people found a Bürger Initiative and were really able to start protests from the first moment on. I think this was quite important. So in the coming years, we had many protests. There was no nuclear plant yet. There was no interim storage. There was no exploration site for a final deposit. There was a lot to lose and a lot to win. And we had many, many supporters from all over the country. It was not only the people from the region, which was very conservative. Many farmers, many Christ Democrat voters, and low populated, and many people without jobs, and right next to the border of former East Germany. So Germany by this time was divided, and we were like in the very last end of West Germany, East Germany all around us. So one idea was if there would be an accident, they could just close the area, that's it. So these were the points of deciding to put a nuclear center there. It was an, an exclusively political decision without any science. And that's the point that started in the 70s, but it's continuing until today. So the first, I mean, they built some, they built some nuclear plants, like we did never have a power plant. But we got an interim storage. We have three of them that are central interim storages in Germany. We have some that are beside a nuclear power plant. They were built around uh, 2021. But before, we had three sites, one at Greifswald, one at Aarhus, and one at Gorleben. So the high radioactive nuclear waste was brought from the nuclear power plants. One possibility directly to these interim storages, but central ones, or the nuclear waste was taken from the nuclear power plants and brought to the reprocessings in France, the Hague, and Great Britain, Sellafield. They wanted to build a reprocessing at Gordim as well, but they could not because of resistance. So it was good for us. We did not get a reprocessing, and it was bad that the nuclear waste was brought to France and to Great Britain and then, after reprocessing it, brought back to Germany and brought back to Gordon. The first nuclear transports that took place were low and medium radioactive waste transports, also to this interim storage. That was in 85. And the resistance was really big against it. We had human chains of, I don't know, 30, 40 kilometers. And we had really big manifestations. And as I said, always with a lot of support from all over the country and also international. And it did not help to prevent high radioactive waste transports. They started that in 95. And they needed a lot of police. It was getting a real violent period of time for Wendland and my people because they really needed like 35,000 policemen. It's all you have in Germany. So it was always a good time to go to the south of Germany and to rob a bank because they had the police over there. And we had 13 transports of these. Uh, in total, 113 castor casks that are standing in the middle of the woods in a potato barn. It's the same buildings the farmers use, without any filters, without any construction that would prevent terrorist attacks or prevent any plane falling down or flew in. So these protests grew bigger and bigger and bigger. And in the end, we had another political decision that there are not going to be any more Castor transports to Gordon, 
So the last one was in 2011. In 2010, we had the political situation that Chancellor Merkel wanted a lifetime extension for nuclear power plants. And then Fukushima happened in 2011. And then everything was rolled back like, okay, we're gonna phase out. But in this year, 2010, 2010, we had 50,000 people coming for a demonstration in our region. And we only have 50,000 people living in the whole area. Okay. So that was real, uh, the biggest we ever had. And after that, we have the dis decision of phasing out all nuclear power plants. The plan is to have finished this in 2022. And I hear some voices from the nuclear lobby still, like, oh, we have these new generation reactors and, oh, did you hear about climate change? What a bad thing. We have to take it for serious. And then you think, so what? But it's not gonna work without nuclear. So they are planning some things. We don't know exactly what, but we have to be really very uh, updated and be aware that they might try to install something else after that, after the plant phase out. And still, if the nuclear power plants are phased out by 22, then we have two more nuclear plants that are enrichment of uranium and um, um, uh, fuel production. These are at Brunau and Lingen. This is North Rhine-Westphalia and Lower Saxonary. It's both at the border. And they don't have any plans to phase out these facilities like they have with the nuclear power plants. And they are delivering these fuels for the nuclear power plants like into the whole world, but especially to some nuclear power plants near the border in Belgium and in France, to Cattenom, Fessenheim in France, and Doul and Tiange, and these nuclear power, power plants are in a very bad state. Maybe from the beginning, it was found out a couple of years ago, and if they were not delivered by these nuclear, uh, by these plants from Lingen and Gronau, they could not be run anymore. So it's not very honest to say we are having a nuclear phase out if these things are going on. So we have still a lot of things to do and to fight a lot to make it sure that we're, re we're really phasing out everything. And then we still have the waste. So in Germany, we have a pro process that is going on because of the political decision not to bring any more high radioactive waste to Gorleben. There was the decision of uh, stopping the exploration at the Gorleben site that has been explored, that had been explored for more than 20 years. Quite some money put in, like, 1.9 billion euro and then there on the first view there is nothing they do not have any experiences they do not have any idea what a permanent solution might be but we have two experiences for salt mines we have two final deposits that were only for low and medium radioactive waste and they are called Asse and Morsleben and they are both disasters, terrible disasters. Asse, 12 cubic meters of water float in every day mm -hmm. and they have to pump them out and it's filled with nuclear waste. Mm -hmm. So it's a serious problem. Mm -hmm. And the Morsian site is not so much known than the Asse site, but they have the same amount of problems. The salt is breaking down and just falling onto the nuclear waste and it's not, it's not safe anyway. So we have these two experiences and we don't think it's a good idea to just dig a big hole and then put the nuclear waste in and fill it and then you're rid of the problem. That would not work, that will not work. We have these experiences with Assel and Morsin. So now we have a commission in Germany. They shall set up the process how to find a way first to decide what is the way to find um, different places that could be compared to each other and then find the best solution of storing nuclear waste. And the whole process is running for about four or five years now. And there is no idea when 
some site might be decided and getting started to, to be explored. We still think they are going to take back Gorlin because they did not fulfill it. It's only like they are having a break with it and they might take it because, I don't know, it's kind of their baby. They always wanted it and it's a big question if we're going to have a different situation now that we won't have political decisions where you have the fewest people who are voting in an area and there you dump the nuclear waste because you have nothing to lose. Or if you take the safest place, but then maybe you're very unpopular if you're saying, well, you take this place. It's, it's a really hard decision. But our demand is that, first of all, we have to get scientists who are really independent. <coughs> because at the moment we do not have any of them. Like we have universities and people are studying there, but they are fed by the nuclear industry. They raise their own scientists and they are thinking in their way and they are behaving in their way, they are developing in their way, they are not in independent. We need independent scientists. This is the first step. And then we need a discussion in society because we're talking about 40,000 generations. This is such a long period. This is such, nobody can imagine. And we need protests. We need resistance. If we would not have protested, we would have a reprocessing, we would have a conditioning facility. I'm sure we would have a final deposit with lots of high radioactive nuke waste in. They would have taken it and that's it. Telling the people, well, it's better to, than to have it outside. We have it now outside. It's standing there in this potato barn. It's not a good solution, but we cannot demand for anything like bring it somewhere because there is no, no good solution at the moment. So we have to be a little patient. And what we are asking for is also to have better concepts for these interim storages right now. They have to put some money in and make them an, a little more safe than they are now. And if they phase out right now, then maybe we can trust into a process that will bring us the best of all the bad solutions. So I will really encourage, I want to really encourage everyone to care about this problem and to talk with your people, with your neighbors and with your family and with your, the people you are playing bridge with and what, what else. <laughs> Just talk about this because it is such a long time that we're going to handle this nuclear waste and the younger people should not not know anything about it or forget about it. We should all take care about it, although we never wanted to produce it. And it's worth protesting because otherwise the nuclear industry will not give away their profits. We have to take them away from them. Thank you very much. Can we show some photos? Can we show some photos? Do we have some minutes? I just want to give you some impressions like we really have protests that are very creative and like it's a very serious topic but people still are happy to have each other and go through all these hard times. What we recognize is, is that the companies always take the very beautiful, the most beautiful places like natural parks as we have one. And our symbol is the X, because we did not know what would be the day the first nuclear waste would come to the region. So we called it the day X. And from then on, we have all these big and small and every size yellow Xs. And we have the tractors. They are important. The police is always very much afraid of them. I don't know why. <laughs> The farmers, they have the most to lose. They cannot take their land and move somewhere else. They have to resist. <laughs> we have music groups like Samba. 
and the 60 plus initiative. That was the big manifestation in 2010. Okay, just take a card if you want me to send you the PowerPoint with all the things I spoke about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, I didn't mention it before, but um, after we finish up uh, on Saturday in Plymouth, um, Kirsten is going to be moving on to the Southwest, uh, where hopefully her uh, organization's work will help to inspire and uh, and support the activists uh, in New Mexico and West Texas when it comes to centralized interim storage. Our next speaker is Tim Judson, the executive director of the Nuclear Information and Resource Service. He's based in Washington, D.C., and is going to update us on the status of federal legislation uh, that seeks to bring Yucca back and uh, introduce centralized interim storage. Tim. Thanks, Chris. And uh, thanks to BYDA for organizing the event and having us here tonight. Um, as Chris mentioned, I'm with a national organization called NEARS, uh, which was founded 40 years ago this year uh, to, uh, to work with grassroots groups, grassroots anti-nuclear groups across the country to build a national movement. And um, we're going to need it to fight this issue. Um, so uh, what I wanted to start with in sort of a basic level is um, to sort of talk about how we got to where we're at with nuclear waste. And what you hear a lot in the, you know, from, from the nuclear industry and from pro-nuclear politicians is the, you know, that the reason that we don't have a solution to nuclear waste is a political problem. And it's actually just the opposite. Um, the reason we're here today with the impasse that we have on nuclear waste is actually because of dirty politics. And uh, back in the 1980s, uh, the, you know, the U.S. government started a, poli started a you know, they passed a law called the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, which created a relatively rational process for how we were going to deal with nuclear waste as a country. There was going to be, an, you know, there was going to be a principle of equity, where there were going to be uh, nuclear waste dumps in different parts of the country, so that, not on so that not one part of the country had to bear all the burden of dealing with this problem. And they came up with a list of potential places where they could site a nuclear waste dump, or they could site nuclear waste dumps. And basically, at that point, the politics started. And by 1987, uh, there was a consensus in Congress that uh, that there um, that that, uh, that no one wanted it, and the only solution was to pick the least powerful state in the country where they could put it. And so, in 1987, they amended the law to name Yucca Mountain in Nevada as the only place to be considered for this first for, the, for a first nuclear waste dump, and that a second nuclear waste dump wouldn't be sited or built until Yucca Mountain was full. And that started a process uh, whereby the Department of Energy started to do studies in, you know, in uh, Yucca Mountain to, to see how the dump should be built and whether it was going to be uh, what, what, the, what the standards were going to be. And what they found, what the science found fairly, you know, within a few years was that this was a really problematic site. And it's actually turned out that it's really an unsuitable site for nuclear waste. It's, it's you know, it's, it's got, it's, it's a really seismic area. There's actually volcanic activity in the area. The rock that's supposed to isolate the waste at Yucca Mountain is too fractured and lets water through too quickly. And they had to continually lower the environmental standards for Yucca Mountain in order to get it to the point where they could move it forward in the licensing process. So, and then at, by this point, Nevada, the state of Nevada and the Western Shoshone Nation, um, which is on which Yucca Mountain, whose, whose, whose territory Yucca Mountain is on, um, have vowed to, to, you know, to, to fight this, to, to fight the siding of Yucca Mountain, you know, to the, you know, to the end. And um, so now we have a political reality and a legal reality, which is that Yucca Mountain is never going to actually become a nuclear waste dump. And rather than start the process over, and, you know, and, 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 and let science guide the process for how we're going to deal with this waste, the industry has decided 
that the most expedient solution is to site interim storage facilities in communities that will be promised that will that will only be there temporarily, um, and to pick and to pick sites where the where the, where they believe that the community is not going to be powerful powerful enough to resist it, and so that's how they've selected um, you know two Hispanic communities, one in West Texas and one in New Mexico, um, as the potential sites for these for these interim storage facilities, um, you know, uh, to move to move the waste from sites like Vermont Yankee too. Now. This is not currently legal. The industry itself is not going to take responsibility for the cost of doing this. It, was, it would cost hundreds of millions of dollars per shipment, or you know, per, per you know, mil millions and millions of dollars per shipment, just to get this waste from the reactor sites to these facilities. And the industry, the industry's goal is to is to not have to be liable for the cost of this waste going forward. So what they're proposing, and both of these facilities, um, you know in their license applications to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission specify that they will not operate these facilities unless the Department of Energy is paying the bill, which is currently illegal. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to create, you know, essentially a ways to go around, this, uh, go around the law to be able to make the taxpayers pay for the transport of this waste, uh, you know, to New Mexico and Texas. And this is, and these are the promises that the companies like Northstar are making to states like Vermont is that they're going to find a way to get around the law to do something that's currently illegal to move this waste to a, to a place where, even though they say it's a temporary storage site, is going to be a de facto permanent dump site um, above ground, um, you know, in communities that um, that uh, you know that are already burdened with um, you know with nuclear and other environmental problems. So you know, this is an irrational policy that we're being presented with. Now, the way that they're trying to do this um, is in a couple of different ways. Uh, there's a there's a bill in Congress uh, that was uh, that was uh, passed by the House of Representatives earlier this year called HR 3053, and this is essentially the nuclear industry's um, you know sort of uh, you know dream legislation. It would both force it would it would try to force Yucca Mountain on Nevada by essentially undermining the state's rights um, to, uh, to to oppose the, the the siting of the of the dump, and it would also legalize the creation of interim storage facilities. Um, like the ones at, um, at, at, you know, in New Mexico and West Texas. Um, now, this legislation has passed the House. Um, it has not been introduced in the Senate, and our best hope this year is to is to make sure and make you know, that uh, that whatever happens in the elections in November, that they do not try to sneak this bill through the Senate in the in the lame duck period between the election and the start of the next Congress. Um, and so, so we're going to. So, NEARS is going to be working with groups across the country to mobilize um, for that lame duck session to make sure that this piece of legislation does not get through the Senate. And so, we're going to be preparing. We're going to be sending out a toolkit uh, to groups across the country in the next couple of weeks uh, to be able to start, you know, prepping people to, to talk to talk to your representatives, talk to your senators, especially um, about why they should not let this legislation through. Um, what the industry is also doing year after year. Is they're trying to, uh, to to use the appropriations process, the budgetary process, um, to get a foot in the door with these uh, with with interim storage, and so what they've been proposing for several years is um, a, what they call a pilot project um, to uh, to uh, to site an interim storage facility, a pilot interim storage facility where they would only move 10,000 tons of waste. Mm -hmm. Now, that's hardly a foot in the door. I mean, that's bigger than most people's closets. Um, but um, uh, but what we've been able to do um, through uh, you know through uh, you know grassroots action across the country is to be able to pit um, the politics of the House and the Senate against one another. And so, because the House of Representatives is crazy for Yucca Mountain, um, doesn't want to do anything that doesn't involve Yucca Mountain, and the Senate has dealt with the dealt with the reality that Nevada is going you know Nevada is a swing state in the Senate, and they can't afford to lose the Senate seat in Nevada. Um, that the House of Representatives, you know, wants funding for Yucca Mountain in the budget, in the appropriations, and uh, and the Senate doesn't want Yucca Mountain to move at all, but wants to move interim storage forward. And what's happened yet again, just a couple weeks ago this year, as we've managed to have it happen the last several years, is that they've they've created zero funding for these nuclear waste projects um, through the appropriations process. Now the problem is. Um, that if the Democrats swing 
I, one or both chambers of Congress next year, this whole dynamic could change. Uh, because the Democratic Party um, has been supportive, the, the, their, the senators in the Democratic Party have been supportive of interim storage, uh, the interim storage process. And if we're going to stop this, we're going to have to, you know, to really work hard to lobby senators like, you know, like, you know, like Leahy and Sanders um, to hold the line against this. And not just in Vermont, but in states like Massachusetts, um, you know, where Senator Warren has not been a friend of ours on this. Um, so we're going to need to be doing organizing throughout the country, you know, for the next several years, you know, to re to build resistance and opposition to these crazy nuclear waste storage plans. But we're also going to need to be working, on, you know, working on our senators to make sure that this that, 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 um, that this doesn't happen. So that's sort of the general message: is that you know we are here with nuclear waste because of a political problem and that we need the science to come first. Um, and we're gonna need to organize like hell to make that happen. Okay. So yes, I'm told that there is a petition um, about this issue on the back table, which people should of course sign and get, it, get all your friends to do it too. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I want everybody to please support the Nuclear Information and Resource Service. We got a big job and there's never enough money. So NIRS.org, your support is appreciated. Our final speaker uh, before the question and answer period is Deb Katz. Deb Katz is the executive director of the Citizens Awareness Network and has led a lot of fights here in New England to close uh, nuclear power plants as well as to get a uh, our governments on different uh, state levels and the federal level to deal responsibly with nuclear waste. And here we are again. So please, uh, Deb Katz. So I've been here a lot, right? Yeah. And I'm back. And it's sort of bad news, doesn't it mean I'm going to want you to do something? You've been sort of out of it for a while because we closed the nuke. It's, it's been snoozing, dealing with gas, all sorts of other stuff. But now we're here. And we're here for a reason. So I'm going to talk to you. It's really hard listening to these people talk because it sort of makes me want to kill myself. <laughs> right? It sounds so hard and difficult. And yet it's something we need to take on. And we're in the process of trying to get people to engage in a way to understand that this is the fight of our lifetime, that this is it. So I'm going to sort of give a little background, which is, you know, as nuclear reactors shudder due to poor economics, expansion of gas and renewable energy, communities as well as states face the thorny issues of cleanup and with disposal of this terribly toxic waste. Now, shouldn't we be happy when a corporation offers to rid our communities of nuclear waste as quickly as possible? I mean, isn't that what we're supposed to do, be grateful? And the simple answer is sure, it's true. Let's get rid of the waste. But nothing simple with nuclear power. This is complicated. The failed policy of the nuclear industry and the federal government are exposed and decommissioning. There is no scientifically sound or environmentally just solution to this deadly waste. There are only bad ones and terrible ones. The task is to choose the least destructive to the human, to human health and the environment, and that's not easy. The Trump administration is attempting to resurrect Yucca Mountain, a failed federal boondoggle found to be wholly inadequate to the task, but the industry and the administration aren't stopping there. The industry is lobbying to create centralized interim storage in West Texas and New Mexico. It intends to absolve itself of its responsibility for its toxic waste, both its low-level and high-level waste. Centralized interim storage won't meet the strict standards that failed, that Yucca Mountain failed on, and this is a terrible idea to target the Southwest for our problem. 
And many, it's got to, you've got to understand, many legislators in New England and across the country supported this legislation, including New England legislators in the House in Congress. What the industry wants to do is make their problem disappear. So what's our responsibility? Do we have any responsibility? The communities targeted for nuclear waste are working poor, rural, people of color, and Native Americans, raising issues of environmental racism. In nuclear power's inception, rural, low-income communities were targeted to host reactors. Now reactor and waste communities are pitted against each other. It is, but it is essential that these communities work together, that we organize together, and that's why we are holding this tour. The issues that plague high-level waste disposal exist in the siting and running of low-level waste dumps as well that are utilized to clean up shuttered reactors decommissioning funds established to cover the cleanup costs and paid for by ratepayers are systematically underfunded. The NRC refuses to require nuclear corporations to adequately fund cleanup. When reactors were owned by utilities, there was a captive rate base to cover escalating costs. With merchant plants, the costs are borne by the corporations. So let's talk about Entergy and now Holtec and the future of decommissioning. Entergy's desire to sell Vermont Yankee is an example of the industry's attempt to absolve itself of its responsibility as is Holtec's desire to purchase the failing Pilgrim reactor. These will set dangerous precedent. North Star and its partners have neither the expertise nor resources to clean the site up responsibly Holtec manufactures casts, but has no track record on cleanup. Waste control specialist, Entergy's partner, is intent on establishing centralized interim storage in Texas, Holtec in New Mexico. WCS has never made a profit in the waste business. Until recently, it was failing, losing millions. In an attempt to resurrect itself, it tried to merge with Energy Solutions a waste company in Utah. After that failed, it was infused with money from Lehman, which is a hedge fund. Cleanup of nuclear sites is seen as a business opportunity for corporations willing to risk figuring out how to make a profit cleaning up merchant plants with underfunded decommissioning plants. Northstar and Holtec present themselves as white knights coming in to save reactor communities, and for the matter, states from becoming nuclear waste dumps. Of course, these sites have always been nuclear waste dumps, so it's just been hidden under the thin veneer of technological advancement. To deflect from their limited experience in nuclear cleanup, they propose a rapid dismantlement of the reactor sites with the added inducement of the imminent removal of the high-level waste to the Southwest. So what's the rush? This is a seductive and potentially irresistible proposal for states fearful that shuttered reactor sites would become their responsibility for cleanup as well as guarding the high-level nuclear waste. This is not insignificant. Cost for guarding the waste is substantial, $5 million a year. With utilities, this is borne by ratepayers. We are still paying for the high-level waste at Yankee Road to the tune of five billion a year, a million a year in our electric bill. But merchant owners have no fallback, leading to their white night scenario. After all, waste could remain on site for decades. It could be for a hundred years if they don't actually act responsibly. So, what is right action? in this complex and murky environment. What can we as citizens do? This toxic waste should move once. Why play Russian roulette with our failing infrastructure? Reject, we must reject centralized interim storage and Yucca Mountain and advocate for hardening of reactor sites. What can be done to protect reactor communities must be to harden 
the waste on site. This includes expanding the distance between casts, double walling them, creating a barrier to protect them from acts of malice, not a wooden fence like has been done at Vermont Yankee. I actually suggested they paint cows on the fence to make it more bucolic to go along with Vermont. We must advocate for a scientifically sound and environmentally just solution to all nuclear waste. We have to recognize our responsibility in this chain of nuclear waste and sacrifice. Can advocates for deep geological burial of this waste, but to do that, we need sound science and we need environmental justice. We are asking you to contact your senators at this point to ask them to vote no on these parking lot dumps that are targeting Hispanic and Native communities in the Southwest. Parking lot dumps is not the solution. It's a get out of free card for the nuclear industry. So these tours are starting now and we will continue to do them to educate people, to help organize, to begin the process of taking on a failed industry and a government that is complicit in helping them basically abdicate that responsibility. And this is a call to action, the beginning of a call. And we started in Montpelier, the way we did with our call to action to shutter the nuke. So remember, we did that, we can do this. Thank you, Deb. I'm going to ask Deborah Stoller off to come on up. Deborah is going to uh, have an exercise here to engage the audience in these issues. So here you go. So you've been sitting for a while, and um, you've sort of taken in all of this information. It's time that to sort of uh, do a little bit of co a cognitive exercise just with your neighbor to um, just if you turn to that person, um, having heard the speakers, talk, talk to your neighbor about what are your thoughts about moving the high level nuclear waste um, to the Southwest? And what are your thoughts about um, uh, taking care of the, uh, the nuclear waste, keeping it in our backyard using scientifically sound um, methods? And um, so, yeah, so just take a few minutes just to, um, so you can digest what you've thought and talk to your neighbor about what, what you've sort of taken in just now as the um, sort of salient points that you might talk about with somebody else. And then um, I'll have another question for you. Yeah, well, I'm going to wait till I, I'll, I'll tell people when you pass it over. So we're going to, we're going to, we're going to have questions if you want to ask them afterward. That would be great to ask. And I, I see lots of great conversation going on now, it's, which is absolutely fine. I know, now you don't want to stop. So I want you to just think about also, um, what more information do you need to have or do you need to hear? Um, and as you're thinking about those questions in terms of what more do you need to hear and what more information do you need to have, um, we can open up the question and answer period to the, um, to the panelists. So that's what we'll, we'll do now. I'll just say that also Robin is gonna be passing around um, a petition for, to ban nuclear weapons. And maybe um, also Nancy 
if you could pass around the uh, the petition uh, um, around H three three oh five. I always get the numbers mixed up. Three oh five three. Three oh five three. That would be great. Um, I'm also going to say that when we're finished, if you guys, if you have any energy to help us um, put the chairs away when we're finished, that would be awesome. So I'm just going to open up for questions now. So, yeah. Does anybody have any questions? You had one that you wanted to ask. My question, I wasn't really clear about the chat. You have to say it loud. Back yeah. Oh, okay. wait. Excuse me, guys. John, could we? We're back here now. We're sort of having questions. Okay. <laughs> so, what is the, the time duration that we do? I said we want to leave it in place. Okay. What's the time duration of that? Are we talking 10 years, 1,000 years? That's kind of that's okay. good. The, the winds can't stay on site for 1,000 years. The question was, how long is the waste going to be on site? I mean, this is a really hard thing to answer. It can't stay on site forever. The waste, the high-level waste can't be by water. By water. That's why the idea of putting it in the desert or the idea of Yucca Mountain originally was that it would be separated from water because if it's exposed to water, then it begins to deteriorate and it begins to give off radiation. It won't necessarily explode, but so that the the idea of we call it Haas, hardened on site storage, is in a certain sense was developed at a summit that Ken organized in Connecticut basically after 9-11, in which the sense that the high level waste and fuel pools was basically, as the National um, Governor's Council said, a pre-deployed weapon of mass destruction. This is not can saying it, this was the governor. And the issue of getting the fuel out of the pool is essential at all reactor sites. What to do with it after that, we have advocated for hardening on-site storage, which includes the double walling of casks, the ability to berm it in, the cast being separated not by six feet, but by 20 feet. So and an act of malice, is it's really hard for them to think of doing it. The struggle in this is to actually then get, whether it's the government or private enterprise, to decide that they have to take up the issue of dealing with it. At this point, they sort of want to take up the issue of dumping it in the Southwest to make their waste problem disappear, not because they're trying to solve it. It's really hard for reactor communities to accept the waste staying there. And I live between two high-level nuclear waste dumps, so I understand that completely. I do not want that stuff around. It destroyed my community. It destroyed the health <laughs> in my community. At the same time, I can't, with conscience, accept that waste that destroyed my community, I will send somewhere else to destroy someone else. And so you're in this terrible predicament. It's the nuclear industry creates a moral dilemma, a, a state of constant ambivalence and being in you know, wanting to act out of bad character <laughs> to save yourself and trying to actually take a principled stance, well, more of a moral stance that says, no, this isn't the way. They have to do it right. They haven't done a lot right, but they have to do this right because this is the most... I'm not going to curse because I'm going to be good tonight. This is the most dangerous waste that's ever been created. And they've abdicated that responsibility. And the pressure we need to put on senators and legislators and House reps all over again is that they have to bloody well do it right for once and not be cowards. And I can't guarantee we'll win this fight. Like, I couldn't guarantee we were going to win Vermont Yankee. But we can sure as hell make them miserable in the process to have to start dealing with this in some realistic way. 
So I can't say should it stay 10 years? No, they're not getting it out in 10 years. I'll guarantee you that. That's not happening. Could it be 20 or 30 if they actually work hard on this and someone comes up with pilot programs that are worth trying? Maybe some of it can move. Is it going to stay there for 40, 50 years? Yeah, possibly. And that's why North Star and Holtec want it the hell out so that they don't they don't have to spend $500 million babysitting waste that they're basically trying to sort of use a pyramid scheme to get rid of and get the great payers to pay for it again. So I hope that was clear. I'll let you present before, before okay. you get totally comfortable. Okay, come on up and... I'll walk backwards. Slowly <laughs> I'll walk backwards. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mary Ames. I'm from uh, Southern California. I oh, stay here. God. I yeah. stay here for a month. Uh, <laughs> Lucky you. In Calus, uh, to get away from there. Uh, <laughs> I'm 12 miles uh, from Santa right. Nova. And my question is, how do we hard store waste right there on the beach? Uh, well. <laughs> Why don't the questions get easier? <laughs> Let's just make this easy. How do they store it? Look, the waste can't stay there. I mean, that's the reality. I mean, I'm not a fanatic. I don't say this is the way and nothing can do anything else, which is insanity. So there has to be degrees of adaptability. Like at Vermont Yankee, it would be good if they could double wall the casks and make them 20 feet apart. But the site is 100 acres, and there are 58 dam casks, which means the best they can do is put a lot of earth basically berming in the casks, because that's the best they can do. And the reality is they're not going to take the casks apart and double wall them. I would love it, but they're not going to pay for that. But what they could do is berm it in, which is pretty cheap. So that waste does need to move. The question is how far it needs to move. There's a military base across the road. Those sites are highly contaminated <laughs> to begin with. So if the waste sat there, it, it is a reasonable interim solution, not a happy solution. People aren't going to like it, but it, it at least keeps this process of targeting vulnerable communities and half-assed ideas from going forward. And that's our responsibility, which is to get the government to do the job it promised it would do. This is the commitment they made, and we need to hold them to it. And all the industry jive is a way to relieve themselves, you know, of their the failing nuclear industry that they want to resurrect on the back of a bunch of parking lot dumps in the southwest. So, you want to say something? Here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I actually grew up next to San Onofre. I spent my childhood driving by that nuclear power plant and, um, you know, it wasn't a good site to build a nuclear power plant either. Um, and people lived with it for 30 years. And, um, you know, th th what Deb says is right. I mean, you know, you can't store nuclear waste on the beach in California forever. Um, but, you know, every single community where there's a nuclear power plant has the same issue. That, you know, they were all built next to water. Every community has reasons, you know, why the waste shouldn't stay there. Um, and the reality is that it's going to be there for a while. And, you know, rather than do these crazy schemes of moving it around the country and putting it in parking lots in West Texas and New Mexico, you know, we need to, we, you know, we need to focus on, you know, a real long-term way to deal with the waste. And, you know, in the process, we need to make sure the reactor communities are protected as best we can for as long as the waste is going to be there. Now, whether we start shipping it to West Texas, New Mexico, you know, or, um, you know, or we f focus on, you know, a real long-term solution, the waste is still going to be at reactor sites for 40 or 50 more years in all likelihood, because it's going to take a long time to move it. And so, you know, we might as well protect it as best we can where it's at. And, you know, and there might be, there might be places, you know, like San Onofre 
where the pace of you know sea level rise is going to is going to you know is going to make it you know necessary or advisable you know to to move it somewhere close by where it's going to, where it's going to be better protected you know for the interim, but that's not what's happening right now. What's happening right now is a mad rush to simply start dumping this waste in communities where it doesn't belong, uh, and you know we need to put we need we need to put the brakes on that process if we're going to have anything like a like a, you know like a like a responsible solution to nuclear waste. Uh, Rob? Yeah. Well, and I'll get simply in that. Has anyone uh, made a comparative cost uh, estimate between uh, taking all the waste around the country to these sites? To my mind, that is an enormously expensive project. Putting it into those type packs and carrying it through communities that will all say, no, we don't want it. No, it's not going to happen, even if they had the money. So let's just face the fact that it's cheaper to do to keep it here. I mean, I meant that as a question, but I... You don't need us to say anything. Question answered. Answered by yourself. <laughs> Cynthia, what a, come on up. Cynthia from Calis, Vermont. Um, I have many questions, but one to Deb, which is, do you feel the kids are any safer that live in Vernon and go to the school across the street from the reactor now? And I want to know more about Elizabeth Warren, <laughs> because I, I've always liked her, and I'm hearing she accepts money from um, nuclear power industry. And I want us to get some of these, these shirts that say no haul, yeah. high level waste, just like that. Okay. <laughs> Maybe your wish will be someone's command. I can't <laughs> say for sure. So are the kids safer? You know, these are just terrible questions. <laughs> they really make me want to drink. I mean, the thing Think with the Yankee Row fight, we could give a positive story about what people could do, and yet the questions that come up, which are completely reasonable and understandable, are all about terrible things. So the fact is that the high-level waste being in casks is more secure that those children are across the street, which is an act of insanity that the school is across the street. There's no way around that, but Vernon chose that, and that's where they are. So they are a lot safer in terms of it. And the fact that it's in broadcast storage is a lot better than it being in a pool. It could be a lot better if the Public Service Board, as one of the conditions to agreeing to the sale, because the potential is they will agree to it, is to burn the damn fuel in. That they could require, and it's a cheap requirement, and it could help in terms of securing that way. That would make it better, because not only would it protect from acts of malice, but in terms of the issue, they call it the shine from the cast. There is radiation the cast gives off. If the, the, it's, it's why Entergy bought up all the houses along that road by the reactor because they were giving off too much radiation at the fence line. So they were able to move the fence line basically by eliminating the house. What an elegant solution, right? This is the technology of nuclear power. Just buy up the houses and you don't have a problem. So the idea of berming it in would actually help the children and help that community and the community actually across the river because there are elementary school kids in New Hampshire as well, right across the river. So there are a lot of people affected by what's going on. I, I'm gonna help or continue to answer the question about the school. Because as I said earlier, I've been attending just about every meeting of the nuclear, uh, the nuclear decommissioning citizens advisory panel for years now, ever since even before the closure. And they happen about every other month down in Brattleboro. 
And I never fail, for the most part, to raise the school across the street. We raised it about the fuel transfer, and that was very valid. But I've raised it more than several times about the actual dismantlement of a nuclear power plant right, right across, with a school right across the street. And I asked uh, Scott State, who is the owner of North Star, I said, are, are you serious? That you're actually going to tear this thing down while kids are across the street playing volleyball? And for those of you who have been down there, I mean, it's right in your face, right across the street. This isn't an exaggerated claim or anything. He said to me, well, you know, we've taken apart um, research reactors on college campuses. I said, Scott, you and I both know, and I gotta tell you, these people take big things apart. They, they take big stuff apart. I said, this isn't a research reactor. Yes, yes, you're right. And I will get back to you, Chris. Here's my card. And I have his card, and he has my card, and I don't have an answer. I've also raised this with the Department of, or the Agency of Natural Resources, which through its various divisions is responsible for public safety when things like paper mills are taken apart or when you have a gas station with a, a lust problem. You know about lust? Leaky underground storage tanks, right? This all fits into it, asbestos you know, um, remediation. This is a nuclear power plant, and I'm not getting the answers that I want, and we are not going to stop pressing. Because what it really involves, and this is what, anybody, this is what people don't want to talk about, is something that a lot of communities are going through as school districts contract and merge. You know, they have to tuition those kids out of that school across the way you know, into Brattleboro or Guilford or wherever. They have to come up with a plan. They can't just keep ignoring the fact that there's an elementary school across the street. And hey, you know, we send our kids there. That's what Entergy said. We sent our kids there. We wouldn't put them in harm's way. Give me a break. <laughs> yeah, we did. Yeah. But did, it, did they check the radiation? Yeah. Yeah, at the fence line. No radiation? They had to actually reinforce a wall because there was some degree of radiation. So I could go on and on and on, but it's not my stage play. Mr. Halaz, come on out. I just okay, want to correct, correct one point. Scott State is the CEO of North Star. The owner is J.F. Lane. The owner of? The owner of North Star is J.F. Lane. He's the CEO. Right. Okay. All right. Thank yeah. you, sir. Yeah. You could come up and say that okay, into let me, the microphone. Let me add, can, I, can I answer about the t-shirts? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, t -shirt answer. The, we're going to make some more t-shirts, and we'll try to figure out how to take orders online, or you can talk to me later. Our website is hallno.org. Okay. And so I just wanted to add something about the concern for the kids. Um, we started a thing called the Radiation Monitoring Project. And so even if the company or the government is measuring radiation, you should do it yourselves. So we have this project where we um, train folks on how to do citizen monitoring. So we provide these for free for people that want to borrow them. And we do trainings in impacted communities, mostly dealing with uranium mining. Um, so this project, you can go to radmonitoring.org if you guys want to learn more. Um, and we also take donations for both Rad Monitoring and Hall Nail. Thank you. Yes, sir. Now you're going to have to belt it out. I can do that. The um, my understanding that the longer you store it on site, the more the less reactive it becomes. So in fact, storing on site for 50 years might make it uh, safer to, to, to tra uh, transport sometime in the future. Where I've been drinking the Kool-Aid. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the <laughs> well, no, well, you have, you have to. I mean, it's all about perspective, right? I mean, you know, we're talking about nuclear waste here. It's going to be t it's going to be dangerous for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, but you know, the the, you know, the the things that are most radioactive in the in the nuclear waste are, you know, isotopes like cesium-137 and strontium-90. That have half lives in like in the thirty year time frame. So, you know, yeah, the radio. I mean, in fifty years, the you know the radioactivity in the in the in the nuclear waste is.
going to go down quite a bit, but it's still going to be really, really radioactive and really, really dangerous. So, you know, it's sort of, you know, doesn't really matter <laughs> from that perspective. Oh, yeah, sorry. So Elizabeth Warren. So, I mean, you know, I think Elizabeth Warren's a good example of, um, you know, of a, sen of a senator who's, you know, uh, you know, following the party line right now, which is, you know, she she needs to be educated. She doesn't really know much, um, but she is, you know, she's good on a lot of progressive issues, especially, you know, regarding, you know, corporate accountability and that sort of thing. But when it comes to corporate accountability on the environment, she has not been a strong senator. I had, I had Elizabeth Warren's people call me for money, and I told them I wouldn't give them money because she was a one-trick pony. <laughs> so she's very good. She has a very good rap, but she has been really bad on the environment, and she will not touch nuclear, and she takes sort of, she listens to Markey, but she doesn't really even go as far as Markey. And they could actually deal with the Pilgrim reactor, which is a failed reactor owned by Entergy that is just losing money. It's on the watch list. It is the number one reactor on the watch list. It's been on the watch list for years. And they are mostly silent on this issue. And she is a real disappointment on this. She has not, but you've got to understand that m most legislators are silent on this. I mean, Leahy has supported Yucca Mountain. You need to know this. Your congressman supported H.R. 3053. Sanders su had supported, the Sanders is funny, like he was for the nuke, but then he was against it. He was for Yucca Mountain, but he's against it, which is great. But he has not taken a position on interim storage. He actually submitted the legislation to set up a dump, to set up the dumps in Sierra Blanca, which is on the border in Texas. And the standard income in that community is, it's his Hispanic community, $7,000 a year. He got that legislation through. It's part of what helped waste control specialists open the dump where our waste is going. So Sanders has a very mixed record. He may, in fact, come out against parking lot dumps, and that would be great. And he can get a lot of applause for that, but that's not where he is. So none of your legislators have a good position on this at this moment. But you're not alone, because in New England, None of the legislators are particularly good, and that's part of the reason for this tour is to get people to start calling their legislators. Now, I know everyone thinks in calling their legislators you won't know what to say, but they know less than you <laughs> on almost everything. They really do, right? And when we were on a high-level nuclear waste tour and we went through Nebraska, you know, Tim uh, was on that tour with us, Chris was on that tour. We stopped in a number of places, did our events, a press conference. Then I was back in D.C. with Michael Marriott on the issues of high-level waste, which was what we were focused on at that point. And the senator from Nebraska came up to us and said, and we talked about what we were doing. He said, God, I got a lot of phone calls on that issue. And I thought, what the hell is he talking about? You know, it was almost empty what we were doing in Nebraska. And I said, how many calls did you get? He said, seven. <laughs> but this is important for you to take in. That seven calls, each call you make, really affects legislators. And you know why? Because they like to work under radar. They like to do things that nobody knows is going on. So when you call them, it's like a deer in the headlights. They what they do matters, and their constituents know about it, and that makes them nervous. And we want New England legislators really nervous and getting more nervous day by day. We need more petitions. Yeah, yeah, you've got to do it. Okay, uh, we're going to continue to take questions, but i got to do what i got to do.
That cask doesn't move without fuel. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pass the can around. It's a mock can. Okay, more questions, Robin. Just uh, two little questions. Has, has anyone put um, a legal definition on interim so that when you say interim, you're saying we will get out legally, we will be required to get out in such and such a time. But I'd like to ask huh. Kirsten um, about Germany because somewhere I think I read that Germany had a better policy of uh, – Wrapping up uh, and and shipping the the waste, and you may have mentioned that earlier. But if you could just touch on uh, what Germany is doing that is good on interim storage, you meant? Yeah, yeah. Well, the difference to the American system, as I understand it, is that Germany decided two things. One is to build centralized interim storages, three of them in Germany. One is Gorleben, one is Aarhus, what is North Rhine-Westphalia, and one is Lubmin, what is uh, mecklenburg vorpommern It's next to the Baltic Sea coast, near Rostock. So this was one step. Another step was also because of political pressure and elections. We had a parliament of Social Democrats and Green Party in 2000, and between 2000 and 2001, the parliament decided or the government decided to build <coughs> interim storages at some of the nuclear power plants. They did not exist before. Yes, right next to, to these nuclear power plants, another facility which is in interim storage. We were not happy about it because it delays the problem. The government was looking for a small solution, telling the people, oh, we're not going to transport these casks, but we're going to store them. But they don't have high level standards there. I mean, they don't have high level standards at Gordim Aus and Lumin, but this is not what we want. We are fighting for better standards in each of these interim storages. They have some, some different standards. They are not built all the same, but they are all not safe enough and there could be spent more money on it. And it's, it's really no solution like leaving it in this state and then telling the society, uh, all interested people that, oh, we are looking for a final deposit solution because they are allowed to storage these casks for 40 years. Yes, but they have no experience with it. It's the first time they are doing it. And it's only an, it's only, uh, an, estimated, an estimated status they are expecting to have in 40 years. But even the people who I would not call, they are friends of mine, for example, people from the Öko Institute. They are anti-nuclear, but they are doing a job that makes it easier for the government to cheat us. I mean, sometimes work they have done has led to better results, so the transports were getting a little more safe than they were before, but this is not our goal. It's not our goal to have some people less getting cancer. It's our goal to phase out nuclear. It's our goal to push the government for the best solutions and to start them now and not in decades. So these Öko Institute people, although they are anti-nuclear, they are not doing a, a good job on my opinion. But even they say that there is no experience on casks for high radioactive waste. So. We have now, for example, at Gordim, they started in 95 with the first transports. So 
so these 40 years are over quite soon. And there's no plan what to do with it then. I think they are just going to expire these 40 years to 50 or 60. And we have no plan B at the moment. So maybe one, one idea is that uh, there are commissions that are starting right now their work about interim storages as well. And it's because of our work of the anti-nuclear movement. We started with conferences about nuclear waste in, I think it was 2009, when we met with the so-called places of final deposits, what means Asse, Morsleben, we have another site, Schach Konrad, that is just being built for media and low radioactive waste, and Gorleben, so these four um, local groups were meeting for conferences about final deposits and about interim storages. And twice a year we meet, the conferences are big, like 80 people from 50, 60 different groups, most of, most of them affected by nuclear issues. And we have created a website and a very big book. So this book is not made new, but the website is actualized every week. And we have written down where is nuclear waste, and it's in more than a hundred places. It's not these three interim storages or the, the nuclear power plant. It's more than a hundred places that are having nuclear waste, different levels, but all have problems. Some are in the middle of, of cities, next to kindergartens, next to schools, and nobody knows. So. Now the government is starting to talk also about interim storages because they are, they are realizing that these 40 years they have, they won't be enough time to have any other plan for what to do with the waste. This is all I can say at the moment. Well, just briefly, what, what is a military Nuclear, we're going to have 48 nuclear subs and the aircraft carriers, and not only our country, but all countries. What happens to that waste? Does it drop in the ocean? Uh, I have to admit, I, I'm not an authority on military waste. I know that they have dropped it in the ocean. They have buried a lot of it at Hanford. They buried a lot of it in uh, South Carolina. And... Uh, not very far from where um, Leona lives, uh, the Waste Isolation Pilot Project is taking some of the refuse from the weapons programs. And uh, as was widely reported, if you didn't know about it, a couple years ago, was it? They used organic kitty litter in the drums of highly radioactive waste as opposed to regular kitty litter and had an accident which released plutonium over a significant area in the uh, the southwest, but I'll let Wilma answer. Well, I'll just add that um, the the website, okay. it, um, it's in southeast New Mexico, and it's about halfway between Carlsbad and Hobbs, and, and the site that I talked about, um, Holtec, that's only about 13 miles north of WIP. Uh, but WIP is an underground storage. It's supposed to last 10,000 years. Um, it opened in 1999, and the accident that Chris is talking about happened in the first 15 years. So that was on February 14th, 2014. Um, so yeah, it's 10,000 years, and, and the site, the waste stuff we're talking about, you know, this is also going to be longer than 10,000 years. So who knows how soon it'll take them to have an accident. But it's, it's considered transuranic waste. Um, and then this is one of the military uh, waste uh, facilities, or waste facilities for weapons stuff, so things from the national labs. All of the uranium stuff I talked about, um, that's not even on the, the scale of low level or high level waste, it's mine waste and tailings, so different, very low level radioactive stuff. Who's that? Mr. Halal. Um, I'll have a question 
for the experts here a little later. Uh, but I want to make two points. One is there's no point in transmitting this waste twice because you're basically doubling the risk. And that makes absolutely no sense. The risk of any single um, accident resulting in castoring might not be large, but when you do it a thousand times, you're multiplying the risk by a thousand, and when you do it two thousand times, you double the risk. There's no point in, in transfer, transmitting the waste, this high level waste twice. The other point I want to make, which Tim already touched on, is what's going on. There's going to be an overall social cost to cleaning up this problem. And what's going on is Wall Street is thinking about, high powered range are thinking about how can we make a profit off of this? So by shipping it out of state, it's no longer a liability, it becomes the Department of Energy's property, and the, the storage sites get paid on a cost plus basis, just like the military contractors. Also, they're thinking about, you know, when, when the North Star deal first came out, I said, oh, this was broken somewhere on Wall Street. And then, after a while, it turns out, North Star has been bought by what? A Wall Street private equity firm called J.F. Lehman, which also bought waste control specialists, so on and so forth. So the, the high-powered brains are thinking about, they're thinking about, oh, we have all these old reactors we need to decommission, and they're thinking about, how can we profit off of this while getting rid of the liability? And what Wall Street does, the way they think, is they think about, how can I turn the liability into an asset? If you think about the way financial, that's what they're doing all the time. Yeah, I just wouldn't give them so much credit. <laughs> well, see, these, these aren't high power brains, these are reptilian brains. Well, I'm, I'm, if you look up at, you know, the uh, J.F. Lehman, the former Navy secretary, this is a very connected firm. But it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out how they can screw us on this problem. No, but it, it does take a rocket scientist to figure out how they can make a profit over an overall social loss, okay? Okay, now I have a technical question that always puzzles me. Why do they think that they can put nuclear waste into salt mines and into salts? Um, salts are basically uh, uh, two ions that cling together, one positive, one negative, one a base, one an acid. When it comes in contact with a metal, it tends to split apart, which tends to corrode the metal. And when, when it gets water in there, it, um, it obviously dissolves in water, so it's even more corrosive. So I've always wondered, I, I believe Kirsten might answer this. They did put a lot of, of nuclear waste in central Germany somewhere in underground, and then they had to dig it all back out. Um, a cost of something like 5 billion euros. Is that correct? Um, are you talking about Let this? Me, uh, it's somewhere in central Germany in the 60s they started this. Yeah. Um, we had uranium mining in Germany. I did not mention this. Um, it's called the Wismut, and it was when Germany was still divided in mm -hmm. former Eastern Germany, and the uranium taken out was especially for Soviet Union to build nuclear bombs. Mm -hmm. And it was closed, I'm not sure about the exact date, it's, it's also my presentation, um, they started closing it with all these procedures and all these uh, environmental issues in 91, 92, and it took some years. And it is still getting uh, cleaned up. And it costs, like every year they go 1 billion euro higher. They don't know how much it will be, and they will not be ready in between the next 20 years. So from the 90s till now, and then 20 years ahead, but I don't know if this is what you meant, meant, because that's not nuclear waste, that was uranium mining. What they are planning to do is to get out the nuclear waste of acid. There was a special law that was um, written for the acid situation. And I went to the Bundestag like 10, 12 times, listening to it, trying to get our advocates in, discussing with them, and in the end, they did what I uh, was afraid of. They did a law about it. And now they do not get the waste off again. They say it is too difficult. We are trying. We have to first do this and that and that. It's like maybe five, six years ago, this law was um, made. And now it is legal to leave the waste in. 
this is the other side of the medal of this law. Before it was only for um, for science, but it was never meant to be a nuclear waste dump. They only used it, but they did not have any legislation for it or any legal basis for this. And they are planning to get it out, but they did not take a single gram back. Um, the website is in a salt mine, and yeah. the idea, I mean, I'm not a scientist, but the idea is that it's its protected from water, that, that, that it's impermeable, or but that the idea, okay, so you have these big empty rooms the size of football fields, and they put the waste in 55-gallon um, drums in a ring of like like two stacks. I think I think there's seven, and then they put that inside of another container, and and they they push the waste against you know they they try to stuff as much as they can into each pad is what they call it. But the idea is that the salt would fill in all the empty space and permanently seal it off. But um. We wonder what happens if it keeps compressing, and then, and then, you know, we don't know what will happen. But that's the idea: is that the salt will naturally enclose it forever. Well, that's the idea. Is that right, Chip? Yes. Yeah. Well, okay. So, so, you know, what what you're asking about is uh, this. Uh, you know, idea that one of the good me one of the good geologic mediums to put nuclear waste in is a salt formation, because you know what they what you know what the industry says is what what Leona was describing, which is that you dig a hole in a salt formation, and then over time that you know that the salt creeps back in and fills it up, and then you know their idea is that you if you put the nuclear waste in there that the salt's going to creep back in and then seal the waste in there and it's going to, you know, and it's going to hold it there for a long period of time. What the industry, you know, seems to not want to recognize is that you have salt formations for one reason. There used to be an ocean there. And so, you know, and, and, and so when the ocean went away, it left the salt formation, but water can always come back to where it was before. And that's essentially the danger of using salt formations is that, you know, is that water can come back in. And what they found, you know, through the investigations of the Gorleben repository site, which is also a salt, but would also be a salt, uh, a salt repository, is exactly that, 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 that water is already intruding into the site where they were going to put this waste. And, um, and you know, and with, uh, with the WIP site, um, you know, the fracking industry uh, and the oil drilling industry are drilling in the same area, and there's a danger that you know that they're going to basically drill into that salt formation, and that and that could then basically disrupt the entire whip dump. Um, now that's what's happening today, because of what's happening with you know with with the fossil fuel industry today. Now, this waste is supposed to stay isolated for thousands of years. So who's to say that you know 100 years from now, 200 years from now, that people aren't going to be drilling for something else there? Okay, it's uh, it's after eight, so it's got a, it's my call here. We're gonna, you've had enough good news tonight. <laughs> Can I just ask one question? Yes. So I understand the um, high-level waste is taken out of the fuel pool and put in the cast. Is it all soaking inside concrete now? Yes. Yes. The the metal casts are then encased in a in a collar of concrete. Uh, but there are vents. Yeah. Yes. So. Uh, so don't drink and drive. Right. And thank you all for coming. And I want to thank uh, the folks at BYDA who made sure we were set up here tonight and did all the hard work. And uh, we'll be back. And remember, you know, four years ago, after a lot of hard work, we had a series of celebrations. Well, now we have to do our follow-up work. And uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. And next meeting, drag some, uh, some folks along with you. <laughs>